Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to welcome Chisato Fukuda today. Uh, she's a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's a medical anthropologist and she focused her research at the intersection of air pollution, public health, and urban infrastructure. Drawing from 18 months of fieldwork in Ulaanbaatar, a dissertation project is an ethnographic study of how urban Mongolians understand and produce knowledge about air pollution-induced harms. She works extensively among a wide range of stakeholders, from Gare district residents, urban planners, scientists, doctors, coal workers, to state officials. She also collaborated with Mongolian universities and organizations on public health outreach programs on air pollution exposures. Her talk today is a little bit different from the one that was advertised, and it's entitled Navigating Medical Uncertainties in Mongolia's Air Pollution Crisis. Please uh, welcome Fukuda, um, Chisato Fukuda. Hello, uh, Sambat Skano. Thank you, Frank, for the introduction, and I'd like to thank the organizers and the funders for the Mongolia Initiative here at UC Berkeley. Uh, it's an honor to participate in this speaker series, and thank you all for joining me here today. So I want to turn your attention to this image here. I took this photo from a plane overlooking Ulaanbaatar in February 2016. As you'll see, the smog covers the city like a dome. And you'll also notice that the smokestack emissions are visible from above the pollution line. Many studies, including a 2011 World Bank study report, have concluded that emissions from domestic stoves in the areas called Ger Hororu, or Ger districts, make up 60 to 80 percent of the air pollution. Over 170,000 households in Ulaanbaatar live in areas disconnected from the central heating grids. So unlike people that live in apartments who have centrally heated furnaces, Gare District families must burn raw coal to endure long winters with temperatures that can plummet to negative 40 degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit. Pollution is also exacerbated by the city's topography. Ulaanbaatar is located in a valley surrounded by four mountains. And the winter climate and weather patterns cause temperature inversion, where a layer of cool air on the ground is covered by a layer of warm air, trapping the pollution at the bottom of the valley. Air pollution in Ulaanbaatar is also a seasonal phenomenon. With colder temperatures comes more stove use to heat the homes. And I think that this graph really captures this pattern well over several years. You see that beginning in October, the PM 2.5 levels spike up. And then it peaks in December and gradually falls back down in April. These concentrations are six to seven times higher than the World Health Organization standards. So emissions Winter climate and temperature inversion and topography all together combine to create air pollution as a disaster every winter in Ulaanbaatar. Of course, there's many health effects caused by pollution. A study by Simon Fraser University claims that air pollution is responsible for one in 10 deaths in Ulaanbaatar. Researchers in Mongolia have determined that cardiovascular diseases, such as heart disease and stroke, and pneumonia among children are the largest health burdens. But this chart doesn't show the less studied areas in health, such as the correlation between air pollution and birth defects, or air pollution exposure and spontaneous abortion. These are also pertinent to Ulaanbaatar. The main focus of my talk today is on how Mongolian patients and doctors dealt with me medical uncertainties with air pollution. I'd like to limit my scope and highlight just some ethnographic material from one of my dissertation chapters. So this is a pretty straightforward outline of my presentation. So first, I'll give a brief overview of the healthcare system in Mongolia. Then I'll discuss how patients and doctors struggled to detect, diagnose, and treat respiratory harm. And finally, I'll focus on how pregnant women 
and doctors deal with gestational harm. And what I'm arguing here is that uncertainties brought upon by air pollution have altered biomedical practice and individualized forms of care. Mongolia has a hospital-based healthcare system that's been influenced by the Soviet model, Samashko model. From, 14, from 1941 to 1990, under the Soviet Union, healthcare services in Mongolia were fully financed by government revenues and was free of charge to all citizens. Under this policy, healthcare was made more accessible. There were many medical professionals and, of course, more medical resources available. But at the same time, there was a lack of responsiveness to patients' rights and patient-oriented care. So with the collapse of the Soviet Union and democratic changes and the significant drop in the country's GDP, the Samashko health system became unstable due to the withdrawal of state funding. And during that transition period, international aid played an important role in supporting the state to maintain that health system. And this transition had drastic effects on health of the population. For example, Jane and Tulendorch explain that in the post-Soviet transition, um, there were a higher number of um, deaths associated with women's reproductive health. Today, Mongolia's medical system is divided into primary, secondary, and tertiary care. The health insurance law was passed in 1993. And by, uh, by 2011, 98.6% of the population was covered by social health insurance. And this chart shows the different kinds of care that were covered by both government and social health insurance. In addition to these changes, I think it's really important to highlight that patient-based care was a new concept. It was a new challenge for health practitioners after the reform in Mongolia. For example, now patients can complain to hospitals. So some main complaints that I received during my dissertation um, they would describe the need to pay out of pocket, or they were dissatisfied with the quality of health care they were receiving, or that there was a lack of transparency among the medical professionals. On the flip side, medical staff have ex explained that respecting patient rights and providing patient-centered services have become an extra burden for their already busy work schedules. So with this context in mind, I'm going to highlight the lives of a few women in the Gare District communities. I spent a significant amount of time living and conducting research with households in Songen Herchen District. So in what follows, I highlight how uncertainties related to air pollution were altering patient care and individualized forms of care. Nara fell to the cumulative effects of air pollution over time. She suffered from shortness of breath, wheezing, and coughing all throughout the winter season, year after year. During my homestay with her, she began suspecting that she may have developed asthma. She sought x-rays for confirmation. Obtaining diagnostic tests such as x-rays were time consuming and expensive. Even though health insurance in principle covered these expenses, most households that I spoke with made out-of-pocket payments in order to cover these diagnostic exams. Despite these financial burdens and long wait times, Nara was determined to get an x-ray to find out her current health condition. The doctor asked me if I smoked, Nara yelled. She explained to me that she had never touched a cigarette in her life. Having spent money on an x-ray and doctor's consultation, Amra expected a specific medical diagnosis that would ensure her proper long-term harm. Instead, she received a series of broad spectrum antibiotics and medical advice to refrain from outdoor activities and to stay indoors as much as possible. Nara pulled out her x-ray and pointed to the white spots on her lungs. The doctor explained that the white spots were infections and that she was most likely suffering from bronchitis. But he also said that it could be an infection caused by a prolonged cold. She was told that her symptoms would go away after a few days after taking antibiotics and that her lungs would clear up over the summer. However, Nara was not convinced. 
the x-ray was not a snapshot of a temporary lung infection. For Nara, the x-ray represented her body's permanent state of damage. She explained to me that the white spots on the x-ray were traces of smoke that had accumulated into her lungs for over a decade. Nara was becoming more aware of her body's vulnerability to the urban environment's toxicity. While she was long aware that burning coal and living in pollution was damaging, the x-ray image confirmed her fears that she was, quote, living in a place that was slowly killing her, unquote. Nara sat x-rays as relief from uncertainties related to respiratory harm and a means to secure proper long-term care. However, the provocative image of her x-ray and the doctor's ambiguous response to the image left Nara more frustrated, more confused, and hopeless about her overall health. There were other women like Nara who experienced frustrations over diagnostic testing. During the winter season, pneumonia cases were common among children under six, and mothers frequently visited the local clinic for testing and diagnosis and treatment. They explained that they had to wait long lines, bribe the doctor, and get ref uh, referrals to specialists, and so on. For example, Munk Jarkal explained that she had taken her doctor, er, daughter to the local clinic several times during the winter every year. In the past, her daughter had been diagnosed with pneumonia twice and was afraid that she would have to suffer from pneumonia for the rest of her childhood. In this case, the doctor did make a clear diagnosis, pneumonia. But this was the third time that she was diagnosed. In other words, the frequency of the same diagnosis made her skeptical of her doctor's ability to treat patients properly and to provide medical advice. The doctor prescribed her daughter with antibiotics and recommended rest at home for three weeks. This kind of patient care was insufficient from Munkjadikul's perspective because it failed to provide her with answers about strategies of how to minimize the frequency of respiratory harm. On the other hand, Doctors in local clinics were faced with the challenge of treating a large number of patients suffering from respiratory illness. Diagnostic tests and pharmaceuticals were not sufficient in providing patients with care. Doctors were overworked and underpaid and most expressed frustration over the overall healthcare system. Not only were clinics understaffed, but hospitals lacked equipment and resources. For example, many hospitals lacked sufficient number of hospital beds, which led to a regular overcrowding of the hallways and lobbies. In order to assuage fears and frustrations among their pa uh, patients, doctors turned to providing medical advice that focused on improving daily habits. One doctor explained, quote, families always like to discuss horteota, or poisonous smoke which is an everyday term for pollution. They say it's causing their disease and worsening them, their symptoms or making their life difficult. And I understand that problem. But they won't settle for injections or pills anymore. They want medical advice. But it's hard to give because there's no proven methods. There aren't studies that show the best way to reduce harm." Unquote. The air pollution brought uncertainty and panic to many healthcare uh, practitioners who were unable to clearly define how air pollution was affecting people's health. Rather than relying on diagnostic instruments alone, doctors turned to traditional Mongolian medicine and local remedies that were understood to improve the body as a whole. Boosting the body's immune system was the most common medical advice that doctors gave their patients who expressed concern over air pollution. In comparison to symptom-based care that didn't assuage fears related to air pollution's toxic effects, doctors found that providing their pa patients with more lifestyle-focused medical advice provided patients, particularly parents, with a stronger sense of control over the air pollution problem. They demanded more preventative measures that would decrease the frequency of hospital visits and improve their child's overall health. So for example, family doctors advised their patients to take chatsargan or 
sea buckthorn berry supplements that were rich with vitamins to boost their immune system. Others claimed that the best way was to spend time in the countryside, in particular washing a child's body with attic or fermented mare's milk and letting them soak up the sun was considered a kind of detox. Doctors understood that this was not medically proven, but since it cohered with Mongolian ways of understanding the body, many families accepted this kind of advice as legitimate forms of care. These kinds of patterns are a larger reflection of how patients and doctors struggled to find answers and a means to control a seemingly uncontrollable personal and public health disaster. While most city residents were aware of respiratory harms caused by pollution, concerns about gestational harms also emerged during my fieldwork. Evidence of the correlation between pregnancy loss and pollution was not yet well established in epidemiological studies or clinical diagnoses in Ulaanbaatar at the time of my research. In spite of this lack of data, I learned that pregnant women were engaged in seasonal pattern making with their own bodies to link their gestational harms with highly polluted months of the year. Nasan Jargo revealed to me that she had suffered three miscarriages. During the first two miscarriages, her doctor dismissed it as a side effect of being pregnant at a later age. She was 37. But following her third miscarriage, the same doctor explained that the pattern could be linked to air pollution. I quickly found that other women were experiencing pregnancy loss. In fact, in 2014 to 2016, I found that out of 70 women that I interviewed, 81 mentioned that they had personally had a miscarriage or knew a close relative or friend who had. Women were closely in tune to the process of pregnancy loss. One woman explained that her abdomen would stiffen, her back would ache, and that she would bleed heavily. She reiterated many times that something just didn't feel right. Other women shared very similar experiences, claiming that they can feel when a miscarriage was going to happen. They felt not only bodily symptoms, but an overwhelming sense of grief. Women were also becoming more aware of when pollution was affecting their bodies. They explained to me that they noticed that pregnancy loss occurred most frequently during the winter season, during the most polluted months. Mongolian women did not rely solely on reproductive technologies or clinical care to draw these conclusions. Rather, they drew on their own speculations that derived from their bodily experiences as well as others. In response to these patterns, women began to alter their forms of care in order to protect their bodies and minimize the probability of suffering from pregnancy loss. Odno found out that she was pregnant in October, and upon receiving a recommendation from a doctor that the only way to carry out a safe pregnancy was to live outside the city, she decided to move to the countryside to live with her parents. Other women started to do this as well. Quote, clean air is the only solution. There's no guarantee, but it's important to take precautionary measures, unquote. What No explained to me a few weeks before temporarily moving out of Ulaanbaatar. Other women who had the financial and social means to carry out their pregnancies overseas did so in places like South Korea, Japan, and the United States. In addition to relocating, some women also started to consult internationally funded clinics and began altering their family planning strategies in an attempt to time their pregnancies around less polluted months. Women started advising one another, suggesting that June to October was the optimal time period to get pregnant. They felt strongly that air pollution exposure during the first three weeks of pregnancy posed the biggest risk to pregnancy loss. In such ways, women felt increasingly responsible for regulating and maintaining their own gestational health due to the lack of clinical guidance. Among the doctors that I met with, the evidence connecting air pollution and pregnancy loss was contested and varied. Many doctors explained that the air pollution could stiffen the womb, which would prevent the infant from developing properly during pregnancy. 
They explained that a prolonged lack of oxygen could cause hypoxia and kill the infant. Regular airflow of clean oxygen was required to prevent the womb from hardening and suffocating the infant. Rather than rendering air pollution as a complex mixture of particulates and gases, most doctors made a clear distinction between Horteota and Sebrinagar, poisonous smoke and clean air. They considered countryside air to be healthy and urban air as polluted and hazardous. This distinction between polluted and clean air was not a result of reading air quality monitoring technologies or scientific studies. Rather, doctor drew from their, doctors drew from their own medical practice, having treated patients in both the countryside and in the city. From the doctor's experience with patients, they concluded that women in the countryside were less prone to pregnancy loss. Therefore, doctors were also tracing patterns, not through their own bodily harms, but through their patients' bodies. Obstetricians and pediatricians were in particularly sensitive position with their patients because expecting mothers were faced with a lose-lose situation. Some guidelines that doctors provided including carry the child a few meters off the ground to prevent the child from breathing the car fumes or use a scarf to cover the mouth and nose area and carry out your pregnancy in the countryside. There was a clear stratification between women who had access to resources necessary to carry out a safe pregnancy and those who didn't. Ginsburg and Rapp used the word stratified reproduction to explain how some women are empowered to nurture and reproduce with access to resources to carry out pregnancies, while others are disempowered. In other words, women's choice on reproduction and health care were limited based on socioeconomic factors. Otno, who moved outside of Ulaanbaatar to carry out her pregnancy in the safety of a countryside home, of course had the financial stability and social network to do so. Her parents had a home in the countryside and she could leave core responsibilities in the city behind. Other women could not afford to leave their household during pregnancy as they bore the responsibility of working a full-time job or supporting and staying at home to take care of their children. Additionally, not all women had family members in the countryside with whom they could stay. And those Gear District residents who just recently settled into the capital city not only lacked the social network that other city dwellers had, but also faced the challenge of having to navigate bureaucratic systems such as hospitals and clinics. So in such ways in Ulaanbaatar, Women's reproductive lives were stratified in the wake of air pollution-induced harms and uncertainties around how to protect one's health. While the trend in medical anthropology turns toward a more technology-based assessment, such as big data and global health metrics, my study demonstrates that bodily ways of knowing or bodily awareness is still critical to public health. And Ulaanbaatar bodily knowledge was not only a means to detect harm, but it was also a divergent method from diagnostic technologies like x-rays that visualized harm in particular ways. Bodily knowledge played an important role in challenging existing biomedical models that failed to provide sufficient explanation for air pollution-induced exposure. The shift in practices with the emergence of air pollution also had implications on what counts as medical expertise. Doctors were not equipped with scientific knowledge about the relationship between air pollution and bodily effects, and thus omitted identification of disease in place of more ambiguous diagnoses and non-biomedical advice for patients. Patients, on the other hand, developed their own understanding of bodily harm by attuning to their bodies and examining their own diagnostic tests. In this talk, I've also demonstrated how city dwellers take on a neoliberal approach to health, wherein health itself and proper management of illnesses were increasingly becoming the responsibility of individuals and not the state. And finally, rather than claiming that all human bodies experience pollution in the same way, 
I reveal the importance of examining what Margaret Locke calls local biologies. In her study of menopause in Japan, Canada, and the United States, Locke shows how disease profiles and symptoms varied across cultures. So thinking alongside Locke, I argue that harm is not solely a pathological event with a distinct set of symptoms that can be applied to all human beings across the globe. Rather, bodily experience is situated in very specific cultural contexts. In Ulaanbaatar, air pollution brought uncertainties. In ambiguities brought on by Soviet histories, contemporary medical systems, and degrading urban infrastructures, all came together to produce different kinds of knowledges and, air pollution, uh, and experiences of air pollution-induced harm. Thanks so much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. You know, it sounds almost impossible to create some kind of a model that will distinguish between the two, but it, it does come to mind that the coldness itself like in areas outside of Ulaanbaatar, which did not have pollution, did they also have an increase in miscarriages in the winter months? So, for example, do you mean areas like Nalaik that are um, I, in I close don't proximity? Well oh, okay. So I couldn't tell you. But outside of Ulaanbaatar, where the, the, the pollution problem is not so great, was there also an increase in miscarriages during the months of October, November, December? So from the interviews that I've conducted with doctors and patients, uh, most of, basically all of my ethnographic data focused on Ulaanbaatar, so I don't have any data sort of comparing um, pregnancy loss in Ulaanbaatar versus other areas. Um, but I, oh, go ahead. But I, oh, I, I, was just, I, I, I just asked that question because I think, it, I think it's important the integrity of your research. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's a great point because like I mentioned in my presentation, and I elaborate more in my chapter, doctors were very aware of the differences between women's health in the city and women's health in the countryside. And it wasn't necessarily just pregnancy loss or particular diseases, but there were also understandings of levels of stress, depression, other sorts of mental and emotional strains that women in Ulaanbaatar had to face that countryside women didn't have to face. So there is some clear distinctions that doctors and patients themselves have made, definitely. Thank you. Uh, nice talk. Um, just a comment. There's some work at the WHO trying to do sort of medical provider training around air pollution, and it might be worth looking into the Southeast Asia region um, offices to, see, to kind of share your findings. I think that'd be Thank you. Can I ask a question back? Um, is this related to social awareness raising around air pollution exposure specifically, or what kind of trainings are yes, they this giving? Is, there are some campaigns around social awareness. There's a brief life campaign that's specifically trying to raise awareness about air pollution, but there's also a separate set of stuff related to training medical providers more on the understanding of the harms of air pollution. Okay. That's great, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I, I was really interested in the, 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 the dichotomy between the city and the outside. Uh, when I was being researched in Mongolia, there was always the sense that living in the city was not really Mongolia, was not the authentic Mongolian lifestyle. So I was wondering to what extent this idea of pollution within the city and also the, the idea of living in the city as something that's not Mongolia I mean, the kind of ethnic dimension of um, the negative effect of pollution on the body. Did you see any intersection there between those two? Do you feel there is a certain parallel? Between, it's not just the pollution, but it's also something inherent to living in a city that is, that doesn't cause, that, that is wrong for Mongolian bodies? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question and comment. Um, I almost feel like there are some contradictions at play because, as you know, during the Soviet era, there was so much of an attempt to create the modern Soviet citizen. And that modern Soviet citizen lived in cities. 
And so what started off as becoming uh, something, you know, to become a civilized member of society, you must live in the city and to have environmental degradation um, and air pollution sort of um, decreasing the quality of life in Ulaanbaatar, kind of, it, it does muddle that, you know, it, I think there is something going on there, definitely in terms of identity politics and Mongolian identity. I, I can't quite pinpoint exactly what it is, um, but I think that it's going in the reverse direction and that there's a lot of discussion about Mongolians having their roots in the countryside. The countryside is pure. The air is clean. There's this longing to return to the countryside, um, but at the same time living out their lives in, in the capital city and not wanting to leave that life behind. So there, I think there are some struggles there. And yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, um, sure. Um, I was also wondering about the, you know, the extinction narratives that you hear in Mongolia about um, outside influence, particularly Chinese. Um, that when I was when I was doing my research, I heard a lot about the the, the idea that the degradation of the environment was actually caused by Chinese, either willfully or not. Uh, and I was wondering whether you still hear these kind of narratives around the idea of pollution, or whether it's is recognized as really something to do with um, coal and therefore not really linked to China in any way? Yeah, I think that there has been a shift now. Um, I do remember in 2006 there was a lot of sort of transboundary blaming um, to China. But from my research um, recently, 2014 to 2016, um, and based on survey data and interviews, it really seems like not only are they aware that it's a Ulaanbaatar problem, but most residents can pinpoint that it's the Gerhororov, it's the, it is the stove emissions. Um, so there is that kind of um, uh, awareness of that as the source of the problem now. And I think to add, um, I think that government intervention such as the SOV program and reports that come out and media of course, that really does play into um, thinking about who is to blame and who is responsible. Um, for example, you know, the fact that the stove program only focused on replacing the stoves in these areas, um, a very technological intervention that changed the the household behaviors of a very uh, dominant part of the, uh, the city population, that kind of discourse really shifts the responsibility of pollution away from middle class Mongolians um, and the rest of society really, expatriates, government officials. And I really do think that there is um, mis miscommunication, no communication, there isn't this bridged understanding of how to make this a collective problem. Um, I think that there's not obviously not blaming China now, but there is blaming Gare districts. And that's affecting local discourse, but it's also affecting interventions that are having really serious implications on Gare district um, households' lives. Yes? Um, it's just a thought, but if you're in this area, you would be the person to pass it on to. Um, recognizing global uncertainties and global realities, I believe that a form of coal called coke, in which they first prepare it, is a little bit cleaner uh, in terms of emissions, but by no means clean. And the idea that they, they use coke, you know, that there would even be a government program to create coke from whatever coal that they are using, but the coke-making facility away from population areas, but in some nice pristine areas where the environmentalists can raise hell. But nevertheless, it might, it might be a small movement in that direction. That's a, just a mention. Yeah, I mean, so when I was there, the um, Ulaanbaatar um, Air Quality Agency was testing alternative forms of fuel. Um, as potential for pilot projects and whatnot. And actually, 
I can't pinpoint exactly what year it was, but they did a pilot project in the Gare district areas of Gandan. Um, and there they introduced these, co it, they were called briquettes, um, but kind of a combination of synthetic materials and uh, coal. And it seemed like that was going to go well in the sense that it was being subsidized and households would be able to purchase it at a lower price. But it ended up not producing this good, this, this good, good heat that Mongolians really um, need. Um, and so that really affected the sustainability of that pilot project. Um, so it is, it, I think fuel is definitely something that needs to be investigated more, but of course more in line with users, the people who actually use it, because they prefer to use raw coal, um, even if there is a cleaner alternative. Um, and so, yeah, that's, yeah, thank you so much. So is it really a problem with Ulaanbaatar itself or other cities in Mongolia who have the issue like Darhan, Erdenet? Yeah, Erdenet, Darhan, Darhan is very bad. It's, it's the same urban layout with the gares and the stoves um, and even, um, I'm trying to think of the name, in, uh, in Zavhan as well. If it's located in a valley, particularly, it, it's, they're susceptible to the same temperature inversion. Um, and in the winter, there's pockets of pollution elsewhere. There's just, from what I understand, there's limited air quality monitors, which is probably why there isn't much outreach on other areas, um, air pollution problem. But they do definitely do exist. Yeah. And is there a sense that people can afford to go beyond the city to live and then just go into the city? I think there, I think there's becoming that pattern. Um, I mean, there's certainly um, houses in Belek in the northern regions. Um, I think that what they were trying to do when they were building in the Zaisan area and um, Marshalltown, they, they're trying, they were trying to build more south um, because there was cultural understandings of the Tula River blocking the pollution, for example. Um, wind patterns and whatnot definitely played into urban development. Um, but I don't know of anyone um, that has decided to commute into Ulaanbaatar and live. I've, I, I know professors that live in Nalaj, um, but they stay, they stay there um, and teach there and work there. So yeah, that's a, interesting. No, please. Um, Given that it's not really a problem just with Mongolia, you see also a lot of pollution in China. Is there some kind of international discussion about how to solve these issues? Or is it seen as something that Mongolia has to deal with? Is, you know, kind of, because there's a particular reason for Ulaanbaatar of that issue that might not be the same as where. But is there some kind of international cooperation in the environment? I'm not sure about institutionally. I think there, there may be um, sort of best practices and case studies. I can speak for sort of the public health aspect of pollution in that there's smaller movements now toward air pollution mask usage and air filter usage inside people's homes. And I think that um, in order to carry out those interventions, they've had to consult other, for, most prevalently Beijing um, as case studies of how they had how they got populations to start adopting um, air pollution masks as a way to protect one's health but in terms of large-scale um, mitigation projects I'm not as familiar just because I, I think Mongolia's case is very the source is different and um, yeah, the context is, is a very different type of air pollution. So other parts of Mongolia have dust storms that so travel across. So this kind of context of pollution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Especially with with China and even South Korea, the transboundary dust across the ocean. Yeah. 
So do you, do you get a sense that your area residents also feel that the gear areas are responsible for Because you talked about the sort of like blaming rather than collecting things. Do the people who live there also do that? So when I was in um, Song and Harahan district, um, there was there's a sense of responsibility in that um, there was a lot of gossip going on in communities, kind of community policing. And so when the stove program was launched um, and there was a campaign to try to improve stove usage and make sure that people are igniting it properly and discarding everything correctly. Um, the families that I would speak to, for example, would claim that they are doing it correctly. Um, of course, as a foreigner and as ethnographer, I think that they thought that I was policing them. Um, but what I thought was really interesting was that they blamed other people in their communities. And so, for example, those people over there, they live in a large house, because as you know, gear districts are not just gears. There are big houses, like mansion-type houses. There's detached homes. And so that kind of, th these different scales of homes would change the amount of coal that you use, um, and thus the amount of pollution you're producing. And so gear, gear dwellers, for example, would claim that they use much less coal um, and can monitor their coal usage much better than people who live in homes that have many rooms and may need even not one stove, but maybe two or three stoves to heat their whole home. Um, and of course, on the other side, people would blame, well, it's the newcomers, you know, people who just moved into the Gare districts. You know, they're so used to, you know, burning all these polluted things, you know. What kind of polluted things? Rubber and garbage and plastics. Those are the people to blame because they're not using coal. They're, they're much more polluting than us. So it was interesting to see all these different dynamics. Um, and I also realized, you know, thinking about that, how problematic it is when these interventions kind of render all Gare District residents the same. Um, I think that's a big um, misconception of these, these areas. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.